إن الحمد لله تعالى نحمده ونستعين به ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله تعالى من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ونبيه ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا تقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون ثم أما بعد after praising Allah عز وجل and testifying that none is worthy of worship but him, and testifying that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was our model and our servant and our messenger and the best to ever worship him, Allah Azza wa Jal, and after reminding myself and you with the taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and welcoming you all to the house of Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala for another Jumu'ah. <coughs> My brothers and sisters, there are two verses in the book of Allah Azza wa Jal that I've never understood the connection between this pair of verses until recently. And they are at the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, كَيْفَ تَكْفُرُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَكُنْتُمْ أَمْوَاتًا فَأَحْيَاكُمْ ثُمَّ يُمِيتُكُمْ ثُمَّ يُحْيِيكُمْ ثُمَّ إِلَيْهِ تُرْجَعُونَ how is it that you can disbelieve in Allah, meaning Allah's ability, in this verse, His ability to resurrect you for the Day of Judgment? How can you disbelieve in Allah when you were once dead already? You were non-existent and He gave you life. And so then He will put you to death and bring you back to life again. It's very straightforward logic. Anyone can understand this. Nothing hard to understand about it. How can you disbelieve in Allah when you were dead and he gave you life, and then he will put you to death and return you to life, the day of judgment. And then you will be returned, recalled back to him indefinitely. The next verse says what? He is the one who created for you everything on earth. So it is as if the verse is saying, how can you disbelieve in Allah's power when it has already been demonstrated on you, bringing you to life in this world? And how can you disbelieve in Allah and worship these idols when everything on earth was created by Him for you? And this is so profound. People fall into selling themselves short dishonoring themselves, disbelieving in Allah. And on a lesser level, even the Muslim, disobeying Allah, when they get confused regarding the prestige that Allah gave the human being. When he doesn't realize that this entire world was created for him, and therefore he is above. He is above living for anything on this world. No, it was created to serve me. I don't serve it. This is profound. And this is not just to offset the inferiority of worshipping a rock, you know, an idol, a statue, to offset anything. How can I settle for living for money when all of the treasures of the planet were created to serve me? They, I am their master. They are not my master. And so Allah gave us this whole planet and honored us with being allowed to enjoy it. And being given through this whole planet a world of opportunities to use, to make use of towards our greater purpose. Bigger than this world, bigger than this life. And I say that and I reflect on that in these past few days as I'm preparing the khutbah and I realize that they actually called the United States of America the land of opportunity. That is the common framing of the country. This is the land of opportunity. When the Qur'an is saying this whole world is an opportunity for you on the condition that you don't settle for it, you don't get confused, that you were distinguished by Allah, in that case use it, that's the default, it's all halal for you, unless I say otherwise that would be the exception. So long as you have things structured right, you will not dishonor yourself, enjoy the world. And so again it is not about idol worship and it's not just about you know living for money it's even family you are created not to serve family relationships family relationships were created you were given families by God so that you may find peace and comfort and completeness and satisfaction through them but they should never come at the expense of your true purpose the expense of your greatest purpose the expense of your world 
And I keep repeating the word, the word expense because when you speak about opportunity, how do you properly value opportunity? You know, even in the business sector, they say don't look at the return on your investment. Look at the cost of your investment. You know, applying that to what is called the land of opportunity. The United States, you can say, is there anything better than Harvard? Put getting my kids into Harvard, right? Is there anything better than, you know, $400,000, $500,000, a million dollars income? It's a great deal. I'm going to work hard for it, even if it takes me 20, 30 years to build out my opportunity for myself and for my family. The true way to assess this is to see what was the cost of this and what will be the cost of this. You know, I have long wanted to visit England, the United Kingdom. Why? Because I want to see what Muslim generations will look like in America because they've been there for about, you know, the mass migration has been there about three generations. Us Muslims here, the most of you in the masjid, are first immigrant or first generation. One to two generations have been here only. So I wanted to see how well will we do? What, what you know, pointers, hints, projections, forecasts do they have for us? And they gave me such a difficult schedule that I was not able to discover any of this. But on the last night there, Allah blessed me to sit down with a great Hanafi scholar over dinner and I explained to him my interest. I want to understand. I want to be able to compare and contrast. He said to me, brother, apples and oranges. Don't try. So what do you mean? He said, I was an imam in the United States for nine years. Islam in the United States is different. I said, well, how is it different? He said, the people that came to the UK were people that migrated villages at a time because it is closer and also they were able to like pull themselves together pull each other together and get there. And they were mostly village people and they wanted to remain together living as villages. And they were more conservative anyway because the villages naturally are less open to you know, change than like the cities. And he has a completely different demographic, completely different experience. And in the United States, the people that came to the US, first of all, were a self-selected group of privilege. They could afford to come, so they came. That's number one. He said, number two, they came for the opportunity. The word got me, right? Came for the opportunity. So where is the hospital I'm going to work in? Or where's the university I'm going to study at? Or where? And they let, that's where they settled on. That was their priority. That's what was in their crosshairs. He said, then Islam after that, for some of them was an afterthought. Like, okay, I'm here. Wait a minute. What am I going to do with Salat al -Jumu'ah? The nearest masjid is six hours away, 14 hours away, 15 hours away. We've got to build a masjid. And so they began trying to find families to get together, to mobilize and get a little house, get a little bigger, expand, build a masjid. Wait a minute, my kids are changing. These are not our values. Look, everything is an afterthought, right? We got to start building some Islamic schools. And so they start investing. It takes a generation or two and we're starting to see the rise of, you know, Islamic schools in mass, relatively speaking. The cost of this was humongous. And you just need to understand where you're standing. Because if you don't, you may not be able to calculate the cost of slipping if you don't know where you, what ledge you're standing on. You see, number one, because the Prophet ﷺ said to us, I don't fear poverty for you. What I'm really afraid of is that the opportunities of this world get opened for you. And then you start competing in them the way the people before you competed in them and then they destroy you the way they destroyed them. And so the American Muslim experience, especially in the last 30, 40 years, because Muslims have been around for 400 years, but the Muslims that were around for 400 years, our brothers and sisters from the African American community, the Muslims from Africa, they were not brought here for opportunity. They were brought here for someone else's opportunity to be the, the labor, to be the underclass for someone else's privilege. So that is not the way to measure that community. And they showed resilience. But to show resilience in the face of opportunity your, is very hard. That's what I want you to measure, the cost, what it costed you to act on it. I've told you before, and you, we need to think about this and just be frank with it. If you say there are 2,500 masjids in America, 
and the average masjid being extra generous. This is not true. To be extra generous, we're going to say the average masjid holds 400 people. That means there's a masjid, there are masajid for a million Muslims. Means if you stuff the masjid to the back on the Eid day, that's a million Muslims. Every single masjid, door to door. What happens to the other 3 million Muslims? What happens to the other 75% of the Muslims? They don't enter the masajid, not even on Eid. Right? So just understand that it's right in front of us. The Prophet ﷺ warned us, right, of opportunity. If we don't have our structure built right, that this world is for me, I don't live for it. And then people that were blindsided by this opportunity, three quarters of them have never returned to the masjid. They might return to the masjid if they decide to pray janazah on their parents. Might. This is the reality that you stand on. So understand it. Be honest with yourself. So how do we work around this? How do we make sure we are of the fortunate 25% or rather the best of the fortunate of the 25%? Because even masjid goers are not safe. After the break, inshallah ta'ala, aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum. Alhamdulillahi wahdah, wa salatu wa salamu ala man la nabiyya ba'da, ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah, wahdahu la sharika lah, wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa nabiyyuhu wa rasooluh. There is ample and ongoing research by Yaqeen Institute for Islamic Research that speaks about faith transmission and they study doubt and the pathways to doubt and you know the, the, what predicts doubt, the predictors of doubt. The first thing we can take from their studies and you should go back to them, this should be important for all of us, is that autopiloting the parenting project, you know, just let things go, it's all right, things are going to work out, this wishful thinking mindset is of the most dangerous things you can do. To feed and clothe and pay tuition for your children and buy them what they need to be equal to their friends. And that is of the most difficult burdens you can put on your child's shoulders and weigh them down with. They said parental involvement, when parents educate their kids on Islam, formally and informally, and when parents emphasize religion at home, they see you praying, they see you wearing hijab, they see you saying, no, we don't mention people's names, Allah does not like this, right? That by itself offsets doubts by 30 to 50%. Already, the child growing up will have a 30 or 50% greater chance to not have what Yaqeen calls hard doubts. So that's the first part, parenting. No school, no masjid will be able to do what parenting does. Then we want to say that we have to invest in institutions. And wallahi, there's no fundraiser after this. This is a mentality we need to refine in all of us. A culture we need to create in our community. We have to invest in institutions. Because there's so much you know the parent cannot do. Where do you put yourself in a place where you can ensure your values are reinforced by other Muslim friends for your children? Where else are you going to have systematic religious education? Where else are you going to find modeling for this? Where will they develop the feel-good memories with people of religion? Right? You know, there are children by Allah's grace who come to this masjid. May Allah increase their numbers and, and increase them, these children that come, because the imam of our masjid, Sheikh Ahmad Zain, holds a stash of candy for them ready. Every once in a while, tries to be unpredictable, he gives them. These things connect you, consciously, subconsciously. And so being really committed to the masjid. This is extremely important. Being in a Muslim environment, an Islamic environment, to be serious about it. You know, I just want you to think, and I have to close the khutbah because there's not enough time to get through the content. Allah Azza wa Jal says, you know, من أراد العاجلة عجلنا له فيها ما نشاء لمن نريد. Whoever wants this immediate life, whoever wants to sell themselves short for the opportunity of the immediate life, we will give them of it what we wish, to whom we wish. You will not get it all. And even if you do, it will not do for you what you thought it would do for you, of satisfaction. The next ayah says, وَمَنْ أَرَادَ الْآخِرَةِ And whomever seeks the hereafter, وَسَعَى لَهَا سَعْيَهَا and strives for it with its due striving, meaning strives properly. There's a proper level of commitment that is required to get the hereafter. And so I just want you to think about the hereafter. Prioritize that. You were not created for this world. Allah honored you above serving this world. 
You serve a far greater and better purpose. This world is to serve you en route to the greater world. Think about that. And imagine, you know, when you think about donations, when you think about attendance, think about Allah telling you, I selected you to be of the people that have a beautiful masjid in the middle of a non-Muslim world where you can pray and see others pray and socialize with those of your values and those of your belief systems, what did you do with that? Did you feel privileged that I selected you from the 25%? Will you fight to hold on to that for yourself and your loved ones? May Allah Azza wa help us to feel the privilege of our Islam. Help us hold on to it and keep it in our, keep it in our families until the day of judgment. May Allah guide us and forgive us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raise our rank and protect us. May Allah heal, heal us and cure us. May Allah provide for us from where we don't expect. Allahumma ghfir lana warhamna. Allahumma ghfir lana warhamna. Allahumma ghfir lana warhamna. Ghfir lana dhunubana kullaha. Diqqaha wa jillaha. Sirraha wa alaniyataha. Awalaha wa akhiraha. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.